Turn to 1 Corinthians. We're starting a new chapter today in kind of a new section in 1 Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. This is kind of Paul's introduction to spiritual gifts. Next week, Lord willing, starting in verse 4, he's going to really go into the actual teaching of spiritual gifts. So this kind of is his preamble, if you will, his introduction to spiritual gifts. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, just three verses today, verses 1 through 3, follow along with me, says this, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore... I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So Paul is setting up his teaching, which he's going to give on spiritual gifts in the rest of chapter 12. And then we have that little pause in chapter 13. That's kind of the love chapter you hear a lot at weddings, but it has to do with spiritual gifts because uh, if anything is exercised without love, then it's not of the Lord. It might as well just uh, dissipate. And then chapter 14 is some more instruction on spiritual gifts. So this is Paul's intro, verses 1 through 3. And there are three things that he's establishing and setting up his teaching on spiritual gifts. He wants them to be wise. He wants them to be wise, not ignorant or unaware, and he wants them to remember their past, remember their past influence by idols, whether it was through uh, habit of idolizing something or whether it was simply by impulse. He says, I want you to remember that. And then finally, he wants them to know the power of the Holy Spirit and the power in declaring that Jesus is Lord. So those are kind of our three sections. So God wants us, and, and obviously Paul's speaking to the Christians in Corinth, but God wants us to be wise. Paul's saying he wants them to be wise. Look at verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brother, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. I do not want you to be ignorant. I want you to be wise concerning this idea of spiritual things and spiritual gifts. I want you to be wise, not ignorant, not unaware, and not uninformed. So he says, he starts this sentence out in verse one, now concerning spiritual gifts. Now concerning, well, once again, Paul is, is responding to an inquiry from the church in Corinth. They had written Paul a letter and inquired about certain things. One of the things they had inquired about was this thing of spiritual gifts. They're asking about spiritual gifts. How do we exercise them? What are they? How do we know there's an abuse or not an, an abuse? So they're asking. So Paul said, now concerning those things that you asked about in spiritual gifts. And you might know the Corinthian church was the most gifted of churches, spiritually gifted of churches. They arguably had all the gifts. They had all the gifts, yet they were the most immature church. They were gifted, but they were the most immature church and they abused the spiritual gifts in their immaturity. So that's why Paul sent word to them. That's why he's writing this letter to explain to them to start this teaching on spiritual gifts. And he says to him, I do not want you to be uninformed. This word uninformed means to be ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't, I don't want you to not understand or be unaware to err or sin through a mistake. I don't want you to be ignorant brothers and sisters, about spiritual gifts. So how is a person ignorant or uninformed or unaware when it comes to spiritual gifts? What are, what are they ignorant about? What are they unaware? What are they, how are they misinformed? Well, there's four ways that I think people are ignorant or una, unaware, uninformed, or uneducated about spiritual gifts. So first, they might be completely unaware that spiritual gifts even exist. So let me start out by distinguishing the difference between God-given spiritual gifts and God-given talents. There's a difference, and they should not be confused. A God-given talent and a God-given spiritual gift. The God-given talent is most likely something that God gave a person at their birth. 
through the genetics of their mom and their father. That's a God-given talent, maybe uh, an athletic ability, maybe an inclination to having a good voice, maybe being able to play a musical instrument. Those are not spiritual gifts. Those are God-given talents. Those are talents. Or maybe it's something that God has developed in you, an athletic ability that he's been developing over the years that comes to fruition later on in life, or a singing ability, or an ability to play some type of an instrument. So that's a talent versus a gift. A spiritual gift is not a talent or an ability. A spiritual gift is something that God gives every single born-again believer. He gives them at least one spiritual gift sometime at or during or right after their conversion. He gives them spiritual gift. Now, they may not know it. They may be unaware that there is a spiritual gift, but God has given it to them, and then it begins to come into fruition for them. So a spiritual gift is not a talent or an ability. Later on in chapter 12, Paul tells us this. We're going to talk about it next week. He says this in verse 11, all these, talking about spiritual gifts, are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Not as I will or you will. Not saying, well, I really want that one. No, no, it's as he wills. The Lord is the one who gives the spiritual gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So God, through the Holy Spirit, he's the one that gives these gifts to believers. D.A. Carson says of these spiritual gifts that they can also be translated as grace gifts. So think of that. They're, They're grace gifts. Kent Hughes says spiritual gifts are not something on top of grace or better than grace, but are manifestations of God's grace to his people. So spiritual gifts are an example of God's grace to his people. At their core, Hughes says, spiritual gifts are gifts. They're gifts. They're given things. One cannot merit or earn grace. It's something that's given And it's something that we don't even deserve. Same thing with spiritual gifts. They're grace gifts. They're given by God. We don't earn them. We don't work for them. We don't try to make them happen. It's something that God gives, literally gives. John MacArthur says, true spiritual gifts are given by God to strengthen and manifest oneness, harmony, and power. Satan's counterfeit gifts are meant to divide, disrupt, and weaken. God's gifts build up, Satan's counterfeits tear down. Now that's going to be important when we get into the future weeks about spiritual gifts. Because I've been involved in church settings and in ministries where spiritual gifts actually tore down. And they actually divided. They actually destroyed. Instead of the intention by the Lord is to unify. Our spiritual gifts are to unify to bring together. If there's something divisive in a spiritual gift, it's not a spiritual gift, and it certainly isn't from Jesus if it's divisive. The Holy Spirit gives them to unify. Satan's counterfeit gifts would be to divide and to tear down and to damage the body of Christ. So how is a person's, or how is a person ignorant about spiritual gifts? Well, first, they might just not even know that they exist. And secondly, they might be completely ignorant on how or who gets these spiritual gifts. So as I've already mentioned, God is the one that gives the gifts. And who does he give them to? He gives them to believers, to born-again believers. God gives the gift. That's how it happens. God gives it, and he gives it to the believers. You can't come back here. At 1230 today, and we meet in the back room back there, and at exactly 1235, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to give you the gift of tongues. That can't happen. That's not possible. God is the one that gives the gifts. We're not going to do it in a classroom and get you to utter some words. Many of you have been in settings where someone has said, hey, just get your mouth in a certain shape and just repeat after me and maybe sound like a, why are you laughing, Jade? Maybe sound like a a sheep, you know, bah, like that, that's not the gift of tongues, all right? It's a gift given by God. And who does he give them to? Believers, all right? 
And then third, people might be completely uneducated on how to use their gift if they have them. They just might be uneducated on how to even use them. It's possible for a believer to have spiritual gifts and just not know how to use them. However, that's not an excuse. Ignorance is not bliss, right? Even in our own law. You could be driving, this has happened to many of us, we've been driving down the road, cop pulls us over, and we say, oh, I didn't know there was a stop sign there. Well, cop's like, well, that's fantastic. Sorry for you, you're going to get a ticket. Or I didn't know the speed limit had changed in Anthony, where Corbin's been pulled over lots of times, right? It changes quick, man, and the cop's sitting right there. You can't, ignorance is not bliss, you can't say, well, I didn't know. Well, with our spiritual gifts, we can't say, well, I didn't know. I didn't know. No, no, no. We are accountable as believers to know and to use our spiritual gifts. Not knowing how to use your spiritual gift is no excuse. It's up to you to read the Bible, to read the Word and become biblically literate. That's up to you. God's not going to force that on you. You got to do it. You got to take the time. It's up to you to pray. And to ask God to teach you his word. It's up to you to seek godly counsel as it pertains to growing in the Lord and learning how to use your spiritual gifts. It's up to you to find Christian community where you can use your gifts in a more intimate setting. It's up to you to seek ways to serve the body of Christ. So ignorance is, is not an excuse. And then finally, or fourthly, these people know that they have a gift or gifts. They know that they have them. And they know how to use them. But they're completely disobedient to Jesus in using their gifts. So this can be they just don't use the gift that they've been given. They're being disobedient to God. They're being disobedient to the Bible. They're being disobedient to, to the church. They know it. They know how to. They know they have it but they just don't use it. They don't care. Apathetic. Or they abuse the gift. They know they have it, but they abuse it. And they don't use the gift for its intended purpose. The gifts that God gives us, the spiritual gifts he gives us, are for an intended purpose. And when people abuse the gift or don't use the gift for their intended purpose, or when people are disobedient and don't use their gifts at all, Man, this is devastating to the body of Christ. This is not serving the church of God. It's serving the church of self. Ultimate, ultimately, it's, it's serving Satan and serving his counterfeit gifts, which are used to divide, to disrupt, and to tear down the body of Christ. A couple weeks ago, our family received... Uh, big old styrofoam cooler on our front porch. I was like, what was that? And I was like, what did Katie order? And I got up there, and on the outside sticker, it was Omaha Steaks. So I was rejoicing on one hand, because if you've ever had an Omaha Steak, they're really good. But I was sad on the other hand, because I thought Katie spent a lot of money that I didn't know about. We didn't talk about buying all these steaks. But come to find out, it was, it was her mother... Uh, her stepmother that bought us these steaks and oh man a full box of steaks so many we couldn't even we have two freezers we couldn't even keep them in our freezer we had to take them to her friend across the street her 80 year old boyfriend that we had to take them to and and uh he had to keep them in his freezer awesome awesome but do you think for a moment do you think for a moment that i'm going to use the gift that was given for anything other than putting them on my Traeger and filling my stomach with them. I absolutely, in no way, am going to use this wonderful gift that was blessed to us, put them on my Traeger, and feed them to my dogs. Absolutely not. My dogs are not going to even get near them. My gift is going to be used for its intended purpose, which is to fill my belly and my kids. They love steak. And Katie likes a, a steak once in a while as well. So I'm going to use it for its intended purpose. So how much are we missing out? How much are we missing out when God's sons and daughters and 
God's people who make up his church, how much are we missing out when they're not using their God-given spiritual gifts? Or they're abusing them. What a tragedy. What a void that's left in the body of Christ when people either don't use their gifts or they abuse their gifts. And this is, this is what was happening in the church in Corinth. And it happens in the church in El Paso. It happens even in this church. Even in this church. Many Christians... Now, understandably, for new Christians, many of them, they're just completely unaware of spiritual gifts and that they exist. Many Christians are ignorant on how or who gets these gifts. Many Christians are uneducated on how to use their gifts, and yet still many Christians are just disobedient in the use or the non-use of their spiritual gifts. So Paul says, brothers and sisters, don't be uninformed. Don't be ignorant be wise about spiritual gifts that's verse one and then number two god wants us to remember paul says he wants them to remember he wants them to be wise about their gifts but also to remember your past be wise about where you came from look at verse two you know that when you were pagans you were led astray to mute idols however you were led you know that when you were pagans, back then, you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. You were led to these things that can't even talk. However you were led, whether it was because it became a habit for you or it was just impulse. But remember that. He says, you were pagans. A pagan is a, a heathen, an ungodly person. So Paul's refer, referring to who they were before Christ. Paul's referring and God is referring to who we were before Christ. Before Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, says, And you were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. In verse 4 in Ephesians 2 says, But God, oh, praise God, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Paul says, you were led astray to mute idols. That's who you were. A mute idol is an inanimate object that possesses no power in and of itself. And Corinth, if you remember, was a mecca for idol worship, worshiping these mute idols. They can't do anything. Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about this. Romans chapter 1, he says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise. They became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for what? Images. For these images, these mute idols, for images resembling mortal man a statue, uh, uh, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. What a shame. What a shame. What a joke that somebody would ever follow a mute idol. <laughs> what a joke. Who in their right mind would worship a mute idol? It makes no sense. But remember before Christ saved you? Remember what you used to do. You worshiped idols. You worshiped idols. Maybe you have actually worshiped mute idols. Statues in your house. Religious artifacts in your house. Maybe inanimate objects like some of the toys in your garage. Maybe your house. Maybe your money. You've worshiped idols and you've worshiped yourself before. You worshiped yourself for sure. We're, we're all our own biggest fans, aren't we? Before Christ, we worshiped self. Maybe you worshiped a, a certain, certain image that you plan to have or plan to be. 
Maybe you worship your looks, your athleticism, your competitiveness, your abilities, your talents. And then before Christ, you even worshiped the devil. You even worshiped the devil. I met a gentleman when I first got into ministry. Some of you know this gentleman. His name's Dr. Greg Reed. And he grew up in California to uh, a family of generations of satanic worshipers. They worshiped Satan, literally worshiped Satan. They literally worshiped Satan. He, he was part of sacrifices and uh, just the stuff that happened to him and the stuff he was involved in and saw and did is just grotesque. And then Jesus saved him as a young man. He moved to El Paso, got involved in, in church here, became a youth pastor, still works in youth ministry. He's in his early 50s now. He's called upon many a times in El Paso by the El Paso Police Department to uh, go on the scene of an occult crime, of the occult, satanic crime. They call him up because he's somewhat of an expert in that. But he worshipped Satan, literally. Well, you know what? This is all of us. Before Christ, before Christ, we worshipped Satan. You could say, no, I didn't. Because we would never say that. We would never say that we worship Satan. We would never admit that. We wouldn't even call it that. We would say, well, we were nothing like Dr. Greg Reed. But that's what it was. It was Satan worship. Listen to what Jesus says in the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Starting in verse 39, he says this. They answered him, Abraham is our father. These are religious people. Man, these guys had zeal for God. They answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You were doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word, Jesus says. You, religious person who is calling God your father, you are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's what the Bible says. Don't be fooled. Even the religious person can worship Satan. And then 1 John, same writer, the apostle John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, starting verse 8, he says this, whoever makes a practice of sinning, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. By this it is evident that evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So this is us. We, we've worshipped idols. We've worshipped ourselves, and we've worshipped Satan, and that's what Paul's saying. That's who you used to be. Don't forget that. That's who you used to be. You were easily led astray to these mute idols. Don't forget that. We've said many times in here, remember where you came from. Remember where you came from so you can know where to go, where God is leading you. Remember where you came from. Don't dwell on it, but remember where you came from so you can see clearly as to where to go. So our past is no longer who we are. That's, our past is not what defines us anymore. That's not our identity. Paul's saying, just remember how easily you were led astray. Now remember, he's talking about spiritual gifts as he's going to get into his teaching on spiritual gifts. Remember how easily you were led astray, whether it was by your impulse or by your habits. So we have to always be on alert. Why? Because the devil, he's a roaring lion seeking to devour us. So we're in a constant fight against our flesh and for the spirit. We're in a battle against sin and for the faith. So even though we're a new creation and our past does not define us, we have to be on guard. We have to flee our sinful flesh, our sinful nature. We have to flee that and we have to seek 
the Lord. We have to remember what our past was like and not go back because we were easily led astray. So we forget what lies behind and we press forward to what lies ahead is what the Bible tells us. Our past is a, a propellant into the future. It propels us into the future. We look at it and we say, oh, yeah, I, I've got to be aware because I was easily led astray. I'm going to go forwards. And then finally, number three, God wants us to know. Paul says he wants them to know. Paul wants them to understand. Look at verse three. Verse three says, therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says that Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So who, who is this person that gets this title of Holy Spirit within the Trinity? Well, the Holy Spirit is a person, not an it. The Holy, Holy Spirit is a person, not an it. I hear people refer to him as an it all the time. The Holy Spirit is a he. It's in the masculine. The Holy Spirit is a person. Don't refer to the Holy Spirit, to the third of the Trinity, the third person of the Trinity. Don't refer to him as an it. Just like you would never say Jesus is it. No, it's a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. And the Holy Spirit is God. He is the third person of the triune God. The Holy Spirit is God. He's not a power or a force. Yes, he will give you power, as the Bible says, but he's not some outside abstract force like you might find in Star Wars. He, he dwells in the believer. The Holy Spirit dwells in the believer. And he has many roles we've talked about in here and we're not going to go into today. Many roles in the life of of the non-believer in the life of the believer in the life of the church he has many roles the holy spirit but for sake of this passage one of his his main roles is to reveal jesus as lord to testify that jesus is lord another one is to glorify jesus in john 15 26 jesus said when the holy spirit would come he will testify of me the Holy Spirit will tell you about me. We, in this room, if you know Jesus, you know Jesus because the Holy Spirit has testified him to you. We don't, you and I have never met Jesus, but the Holy Spirit has testified to us who Jesus is. And then in John 16, 14, it says, and he will glorify me. Jesus, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will glorify me. He will Take of what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. Awesome. This subordinate yet equal relationship as we've talked about in the last few weeks. So Paul wants them to know two things in this verse 3. It's, it's really two sides of the same coin. It's two different sides of the same coin. Number one, Paul says, I want you to know that no one speaking by the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit of God can say Jesus is cursed. This word cursed or accursed, it's the word anathema. It means banned or being excommunicated. One who is excluded from the favor of God and devoted to destruction. So no one can say Jesus is anathema if they're in the spirit. Now, people can say that. People can say that. But anyone who has the spirit in them cannot say that. They couldn't say it. They couldn't say Jesus is anathema. Jesus is cursed. Jesus is banned. Jesus is devoted to destruction. Jesus is excluded from the favor of God. No one could say that. So apparently there were people in the church who were claiming to be these spirit-filled Christians. Why? Because they had these miraculous gifts and these, this enthusiastic, bizarre things happening in the church. And so they were claiming to be super spirit-filled, and yet they cursed Jesus. And it's possible that some of these so-called Christians uh, were also uh, Jews. They came from a Jewish background. They came from this Jewish background, and they would cite from the law, from their own law, Deuteronomy 21, 23, that says, cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. Well, that's speaking of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus was cursed by God on a tree when he hung on that tree. And a Jew would say, well, that can't be that can't be Jesus. That can't be the Savior of the world. That can't be the Messiah. He's been cursed by God. 
So they cursed the name of Jesus. So Paul's saying that anyone who has truly been born again by the Holy Spirit cannot, cannot, will not and cannot say Jesus is accursed. And then number two, Paul says, I want you to know, I want you to understand, I want you to know that no one can say that Jesus is my Lord except by the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit. So no one who, this is why it's the, the, the two sides of the same coin, no one who is saved, who has the Holy Spirit, can curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord unless they have the Holy Spirit. He says, I want you to know that no one can say Jesus is my Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Charles Spurgeon said, a man is not saved against his will, but he is made willing by the operation of the Holy Spirit, a mighty grace which he does not wish to resist enters into the man, disarms him, and makes a new creature of him, and he is saved. The Holy Spirit reveals to a person that Jesus truly is Lord, and it comes through this revelation. The, the title for Lord here in, in verse 3 means uh, deity. It's divine. Jesus is God. Paul's saying only those who have truly been born again by the Holy Spirit can genuinely declare Jesus is Lord. They can truly confess that Jesus is God. And how is this proven? This is proven by their lifestyle. Do they believe in the gospel? Do they repent from their sin? Do they submit to Jesus? Do they obey the word of God? Do they seek to fulfill the will of God? Jesus said that there are people who will call on Jesus, maybe even say that he is Lord from their lips, but they don't prove it by the way they live and by having a truly regenerate, changed heart. They even do many things in his name. Listen to the harsh and sobering statement from Jesus. If you've never heard this, and if you've heard it a hundred times, don't ever let it uh, go over your head or plug your ears. Listen to this harsh and sobering statement from Jesus' own mouth, his own lips. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Wow. Only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Born-again Christian does the will of the Father. And the will of the Father is found in the word of the Father. How do you know you say, well, what's the will of the Father? It's found in the word of the Father. It's found in the Bible. That's the will of the Father. And a truly born-again Christian does that. That's how they... That's how they prove that Jesus is Lord. That's how they can declare with their mouth, Jesus is Lord. They prove it by their lives and, and, and by abiding in Christ and by being a man and a woman of the word of God. No born-again Christian could ever say that Jesus is accursed and only a born-again Christian can genuinely declare that Jesus is Lord. So, so let me ask you, do you declare Jesus is Lord? Do you declare Jesus is Lord? Do you believe that Jesus is is God? Let me ask it more personally. Is Jesus your Lord? Is he your Lord? Have you declared that with your lips? Jesus, you are my Lord. Have you declared it with your repentance? Have you declared it with your change of mind? Have you declared it with your change of action? You've repented and turned towards Christ. Have you declared it in your heart? Have you declared Jesus is Lord in your heart? What is our heart? It's our mind, our will, our emotions, and our desires. Have we declared that? Do we daily declare Jesus is Lord? You cannot do it apart from the Holy Spirit. It's not just words from your mouth. It's from a regenerate heart that the Holy Spirit does in the work of the non-believer. He regenerates their heart and they declare Jesus is Lord. Yes, he's Lord. Does Jesus know he's your Lord? Do others know that Jesus is your Lord? Do they see that 
uh, metamorphosis has occurred in your life, that you really have been transformed, that you are a new creation and the old things really are gone. There really are new things that you truly have gone from this caterpillar state to a butterfly, this metamorphosis. You once slowly crawled on the ground and you left this trail of slime behind as a caterpillar and now you have these beautiful wings and you fly, you soar like a butterfly. You breathe in new air. You have a new lease on life. You have a, a new purpose. You have an eternal purpose. This is the metamorphosis that happens in the life of a person who has been born again. You're in Christ. Therefore, you are a new creation by the power of God and the work of Jesus on the cross and in the grave and by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. The Bible says you have been born again. Praise God. So God wants us to be wise. He, w he wants us to be wise. He, he does not want us to be ignorant. He doesn't want us to be ignorant of him, ignorant of his son, ignorant of the Holy Spirit, ignorant of the gifts that he gives us. God wants us to remember from where we came. He wants us to remember that, but not dwell on it. He wants us to remember that so we know where we're going. He doesn't want us to dwell on our past. He just wants us to be aware and be keen when it comes to the tricks and the schemes of the devil and our, even our own flesh. And he wants us to flee our old life, leave them behind, and that God, God wants us to declare that Jesus is Lord. Those of you that are not saved, those of you in here that are not saved, if there's anyone in here that is not saved, he wants you to quit cursing Jesus. Quit cursing Jesus. God wants you to know Jesus. He wants you to submit to him as the Lord now, not after death when it's too late. Submit to him as Lord now, not later, not when it's too late. And those of you that are saved, he wants you to walk in that salvation. And he wants us all that are saved to declare to the entire world, Jesus is Lord. By the power of the Holy Spirit in me, I can declare Jesus is Lord. There's no closet Christians. Walk as though Jesus is Lord. Speak as though Jesus is Lord. And live as though Jesus is the Lord. The Lord. So as we come to a close here, Take this time. We, last week we spoke about communion, and Andrew wasn't here. He was sick, but I mentioned last week that it's a confessional time. Communion represents this time of confession, confession of, of doing business with God. So when Andrew and the rest of the team comes up here and, and, and he plays some instrumental, whatever it might be, that's time of confessional to the Lord, to do business with God, whatever it is. Jan and Stephen, they're going to be standing in the back. If you need someone to pray with you, they'll be back there to pray with you. But you don't have to, you know, like we said last week, you don't have to come up here. You can do it in your seat. Do business with God in your seat as you lead into a time of communion with him. That's, that's the business to do. So let us remember, walk as though Jesus is Lord and speak as though Jesus is the Lord of our life. And let us live as though Jesus is Lord. Juice is going to lead us in communion. I'm going to pray for us, and then he'll come up here. Father, thanks for uh, gathering us. Just, you put it on our heart. There's not a single person here that you didn't give the unction to come here. They came here because you did that. You brought them here. You sustained their breath all night. You woke them up this morning, whether through an alarm or their own uh, internal clock. You brought them here, and I know, God, you brought them here to worship you, and part of that process is a time of confession. A time to, to just do business with you. Would each of us not be too proud? Would you break our pride by your Holy Spirit, break our pride as to think we don't need to do business with you that we would today, whatever it might be. Maybe it's reconciliation with uh, a loved one, whatever it might be. Maybe it's, it's sin that we just need to confess. Uh, whatever it is, God, would you do business with each person in here this morning? Maybe it's those that don't know you. Do business in them. Father, reveal yourself to them by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray.